Good morning, good morning. Just about still squeezing in on the morning, and I can see there's a lot of people changing, coming, and going. So we have a, in fact, I can't think of a more important topic to be talking about today. How, as leaders, do we get the most of, out of, and provide support to the 8.1 billion people that we have in the world today? And I'm privileged to be here alongside two truly extraordinary women. They have practical experience not just in the public sector or the NGO sector, but also in the private sector. They know how to deliver both financial and social KPIs. So these are people that you want to listen to. On my immediate left, we have Muna Abu Sulaiman. I hope I haven't massacred your name, apologies. A visionary philanthropic and international development leader who specializes in creating impact and fostering innovation. She has launched, invested in, managed, and led transformations for multiple startups, businesses, and foundations throughout her career, including Transform VC, Health Tech, Health Key Tech, excuse me, Glow Work, and the Al Walid bin Talal Foundation. I should have practiced. And on Muna's left is Amanda Pullinger. Amanda's an inspirational global nonprofit leader, passionate about empowering professionals from every background to succeed and helping organizations reach the full potential of their human capital. She's also the former CEO and current senior advisor of 100 Women in Finance and holds a number of non-exec and board positions and advisory roles. So let me open up the conversation to a big question, because we had a, the privilege of chatting last week, so I know that you have the ideas. But if in the next two minutes, what is the one idea that you have that you truly b believe could transform the world, transform humanity, transform human productivity, what would it be? And perhaps, Moon, I'll start with you. So the, the idea that I have is something that deals more with my philanthropic work rather than with my um, investment. But the idea of having an Amazon-like data platf uh, platform for helping all NGOs all over the world so that uh, information transparency as well as the supply, chain, uh, the supply chain of all needs is in one place for everybody. If you want to help female education, choose the theme or choose the... Uh, the country and then figure out where is the investments are needed and the donations are needed and you go in and you help it because it's huge subjects right so female education but it could be about providing sanitary pads for the students it could be about teacher training uh, for more female teachers it could be about uh, providing um, uh, uh, bus transportation or so lots of different things and if each person if we trust the world that it is a good place that people want to help, I think something like that could equalize um, NGO fundraising in a way that we have not seen so far. Okay, and Amazon for? Uh, NGOs. For NGOs, uh, the NGO Amazon. Okay, Amanda. So I'd actually like to um, take that one step further and say that so, yes, great for the nonprofit world, but I actually think there are plenty of people around the world who have business ideas that are investable in. What they also lack is, is the visibility, um, the credibility that they are investable in. And so I think uh, what I would want to see is a real attempt to create visibility for the for all of the people involved in the capital allocation chain of, 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 of activity, 
You, know, you have capital allocators. Okay, who are they giving the money to? We need greater visibility for VCs that are more diverse because it's those more diverse VCs that are going to be deliberate about finding those interesting ideas at a local level. Um, and so it's, it's, that, it's that kind of chain uh, connection um, from the money to the funds to then the ideas that are investable in. I think for too long, particularly women-run businesses, have been seen as charity. And I don't think that's the case. I think there are lots of examples, which we can go into in a little while, of business ideas that actually are profitable. Um, and so if, they are, if they're discovered as an idea, those capital allocators are not giving charity, they're investing in those ideas. So it's a similar idea of this database, of this accessibility to the ideas, to the, to the VC managers. So, so for both of you, I'm just wondering, where's the challenge here? So you're both talking about identification, first of all. You know, how do we identify the recipients? How do we identify the, the investors? And you're both talking about connectivity. So it seems to me that, I mean, there's a whole load of tech experts here in the room. We're pretty good at, we've got all sorts of ways that we, we identify people. We've got all sorts of ways that we connect. Why is it not happening? What's the delta? What needs to change? So in my, with my idea, the regulations, uh, the uh, transparency, the idea of credibility. So for example, post 9-11, there was a lot of terrorist um, laws uh, that were passed, uh, the fear of funding terrorists. So a lot of NGOs that were in conflict areas or with um, places that were, for example, potential uh, problematic areas, um, these NGOs basically fell off the map. They were no longer funded because everybody was afraid to fund them, uh, even the United Nations. And so these communities that they were serving are all so severely underfunded. So um, regulations, uh, tax exemption, is for usually, uh, except the United States usually, is only for uh, local uh, NGO uh, giving, not global. So this idea of transforming uh, through maybe the United Nations or ECD countries, but uh, creating the regulation that would allow people to get the tax benefit in their own country, yeah. but give globally, that would be a change, uh, the catalyst. So this is, this is how we need the government officials in the room to actually take action. They need to start changing the regulatory environment. What else is missing? So I think one of the biggest issues is the perception of what an expert looks like in our world. So if you close your eyes and think about what does a VC investor look like, what are you thinking? And most people will think that it's a, frankly, a white man. Right? Nothing against white men, right? We need, we need people of all, of all shapes and sizes. The big issue is that we need, we need more people with different ideas, with access to different parts of the market. Because if you're going to get to the key issues in the world, you can't exclude, for example, half the population from coming up with those solutions. The challenge becomes, you know, who do you trust? And, and the money world... And you know, I've done a lot of work around female fund managers, for example. It is not that women don't have the skills. It is not that women don't produce the returns. It is the perception, it is the relationships that those capital allocators have that actually are even more important than performance. And so getting visibility, so getting women, getting women from different parts of the world, getting men from different parts of the world, on stages like these is actually a critical part of changing the perception of what an expert could look like. This is an amazing point that she made, but also like we get a lot of, why aren't women investing more in women? Mm -hmm. And one, because we don't have as many women who are in positions to invest. Uh, one, because of in many countries, for example, traditionally, the decision making was made by men. This is the first generation of women that are coming into decision making, and so they are a little bit more um, uh, shy. That's why networks like what Amanda talked about in the beginning are so important so that they embolden each other. 
But the numbers are less. There's less women able to invest or have that kind of money, which is from $5,000 ticket to the $100 million ticket, than there are men who are in the same position. So we need the allies to come in as well and invest in women, not just women investing in women. Yeah, so, I, I, I agree, but, but there's also a lack of investment in women entrepreneurs. And I think that women are uniquely positioned to understand the challenges of that. So one would hope that women VCs would be more alert to ensuring that they're certainly not, you know, they're not discriminating against women investors. And, um, you know, I, I want to give a couple of examples of funds that are, that are really making a difference, right? They're making a social impact, but they're doing it for investment reasons. So 535 Ventures, which is a Pan-Africa VC fund, they happen to be women investors, but, you know, they could be men too are investing in really interesting business ideas that have been developed, as it happens by women, for their, to, in order to overcome their own personal issues. So there is, a, there is an organization called SUSU, S-U-S-U, -S -S which is an organization that was created by a woman who happened to be in the African diaspora, outside of Africa, and, and her father ended up having a big healthcare issue that she couldn't address from afar. So she's created a technology platform that enables the diaspora to invest in the healthcare of their local family members, right? This is a business idea. It overcomes a social issue, but it actually is something that is going idea. to be profitable. I'm just going to say that we have with us Dr. Adwal Materi right here, who's a major scientist with an amazing idea of nanoparticles that will help inflammation. And she gave a talk a few years ago, uh, in, and she works in the U.S., and she was, I think, an Obama fellow and won so many competitions. So we have the scientists and we have the women who are coming in, but she is just more less likely to be invested in in the type of... Um, uh, in the amounts that she needs for this kind of research than a male who's doing the same thing. It's just, so, this is okay. data. So, 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 let me, so let me pick up on that. You know, so you've identified the challenge. I want to take the next step. You know, so I've been here for two days and I've met some phenomenal female businesswomen and male businessmen who have the resources to invest. So what do we do Concretely, what's the recommendation? If you were in front of, I'm not going to name names, but if you were in front of one of these people, what is it that needs to change? What is the technology that needs to change? I'm going to come to you because you were just mentioned. So can, can we get a mic for this lady here, please? Can we get a mic for this lady, please? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so what, is it, what is it so concretely, and I'll come to you in a second, what is it concretely that we can do sitting here to change the conversation we're having for next year? So in Transform VC, which is something that is about marginalized communities, whether they're women or um, people in the diaspora in the United States, we are actively seeking and going and we're doing roadshows to go and talk to um, scientists uh, in universities and uh, innovation hubs telling them that we exist maybe we can't give them the big ticket numbers that they're looking for right now but we are the entry point if we can't help them we will tell them who can help them okay. and we will push for them uh, either in our own uh, fund or with other funds to get that first step that first major uh, uh, seed so each I think there's a, there's this concentrated effort and we get a lot of PR but if you look at it, if you look at the need, we are just a drop in the bucket. Okay. Let, let me, I'll come back to you, Amanda. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for mentioning that, putting me on the spot. But I, I've always thought of it as a cognitive bias issue. Our human brains are wired to be afraid of the unfamiliar. And our money is, money is the spine of life. And it's very risky where you put your money. And so this is where fear comes in. When you, look at, when you look at somebody that is not the usual, you have a subconscious fear, the fear of the unfamiliar. So I always look at it that way. Okay, it, like, you said, mo like you said, most of the 
men in the in VC world, when I go to JP Morgan Healthcare, which is the largest healthcare investment conference in the world, uh, everybody looks the same. And so when you're investing, there is no fear in the unfamiliar, but there's a fear in the unfamiliar. There's no fear in the familiar, there is fear in the unfamiliar. So I, I think it's a, the way our brains were wired that helped us survive as human beings when we were ready to be attacked, the fight or flight, the fast think, slow think mentality. At least that's how I see it. So speaks the scientist. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. so my question, thank you so much. So my question for the two of you, because we're running out of time, is if you want the people in this room, the people listening to this conversation, to do one thing, what is the one thing you want them to do? What is the action that you want them to take? Amanda, why don't we start with you? So I think I want the capital allocators in the room to ask the question of their funds and their investments. You know, are you looking at the broad re realm of people out there who are investing? Are you truly looking at a diverse population? And with your own personal money, similarly, asking the questions because nothing will change. It is about money and trust at the end of the day and relationships. Nothing will change. The money won't trickle down unless people are asking the difficult questions. Okay, and if we've got time, I want to come back to that because I want to, you know, you and I both know that you ask those questions and people go, oh, yeah, 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 we're doing it. So what's the comeback and what is the statistic mm -hmm. or fact, scientific fact that we can use to say, Come on, let's, let's be serious about this, but Muna. So I worked with Gucci on their equity. Uh, I was on the equity board and we were looking at what does diversity mean and how can it, and if you're not doing actual KPIs and measuring every quarter and figuring out how diverse are my teams, you're missing out on a lot of ideas, a lot of input that can help you reach out to those communities that you're not usually in. And so for me, I think my ask is how diverse are your teams from the bottom up all the way to the leadership, and what are you doing about it to make sure that you're not missing the opportunities that are right in front of you, but you don't see them? So and the Harvard Business Review in 2018 did a report on a study that it was done with 20,000 VCs around the world. And they looked at the composition of their deal team and the long-term investment returns on those deals. The worst performing deals were deals done where all the, D the VC team went to the same university. The best performing deals were done where the team was ethnically diverse. And I love this study because I haven't mentioned gender. Mm -hmm. Gender's in the middle there. But what it speaks to is, you know, a homogenous team may get on better, but actually they're missing out, not just on opportunities, but they're, they, are, they are blindsided by some of the risks of opportunities because they all think the same. So let me echo that in closing, which is, you know, I run a business focused on international affairs. And I will tell you again and again and again, resilience comes from looking at different perspectives, seeing the world in different ways. And I think that's exactly the conversation that we've had here is diversity is key and it's not just diversity of gender but it's diversity of thought so with that thank you both so much for joining me i enjoyed this i hope you enjoyed this and i look forward to uh, picking up the conversation offline thank you thank you